I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Duluth is here to talk about the school's budget, the academic year and more. Well the start of the 2016 shipping season has been relatively smooth with little ice on the big lake. We will talk with the port director and get his outlook for the season. And we'll have the week's business news, a story from the news file and hear one person's St. Louis River story. It's all coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North and thank you again for watching. Julie, we're finally getting a taste of warm spring weather. Yeah, it's great. It was a beautiful day. I expect it's going to be a beautiful weekend. I so think it is. Enjoy that's, it. that's the forecast. All right. We've got some great guests. All right. Thank you, Denny, and welcome everyone. The 2015-16 school year is winding down at the University of Minnesota Duluth with nearly 11,000 graduate and undergraduate students preparing for the summer break or looking for jobs. While the students continue working toward their future, administrators at UMD also have work to do. The school is working to fix a structural imbalance and close a $4 million, a $4 million budget deficit. And here to talk about these issues and more is Lenley Black, the chancellor of the University of Minnesota Duluth. And thank you for being here, Chancellor. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. What, what's meant by a structural imbalance? Well, basically it's a deficit. Mm -hmm. Structural imbalance indicates that it is a recurring uh, deficit that uh, we have to solve. And so that's, that's what we're working very hard to do. We rolled out a six-point plan of addressing uh, the deficit over the next several years, and we now have a faculty task force and a staff task force who are working on a framework uh, to uh, develop the uh, specifics of that plan. Mm -hmm. If you, you sh shorten it down a little bit, how will you fix the problem? Well, through a number of strategies. Uh, first of all, we're going to have a required savings program for each of the units so that each unit will have to take at least 1% of their budget every year and find ways to reduce uh, expenses or increase uh, revenues. Uh, we also are looking at uh, potentially doing some restructuring in our schools and colleges focused on administrative costs and administrative savings that, that we could find through a potential restructure or, or changes that might be made. Uh, we're also looking at optimizing our course offerings, uh, looking at uh, majors or minors that might be combined or delivered differently. Will you uh, be dropping so, some programs? Uh, very possibly, possibly so. We'll, but we'll have to see how, how that works out. Yeah. So, and, and also always looking at new gen revenue generation. So this is not just about cutting, but it's about looking for new opportunities to maximize our strengths. We have some areas that are in very high demand, and so figuring out how we can better meet that demand and at the same time keep our core program strong is, is part of what we're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're also very focused on what we do best, very focused on our strategic priorities and what it takes to make UMD the great place it is and to help us become even better in the in the future. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you would look at as you prioritize programs and try to optimize the course offerings mm -hmm. and decide which ones may or may not be combined or, or eliminated? Well there are a number of things. I mean we look at student need and student mm -hmm. demand uh, is is one, one factor. Uh, but we also look at the strategic importance for the programs. We, we have some small programs that are very critical to our liberal education programs and for the foundation courses that all students need. And so that, that's a factor that we look at. Uh, we also look at some changing trends in terms of the kinds of uh, employment opportunities that are available for students and how we can best meet workforce needs uh, in our area. But uh, also always keeping a mind toward excellence, uh, always keeping a mind toward what, what we need to provide uh, the best educated 
students we can and to continue to help them be outstanding global citizens. In your plans, will some employees take a hit? Uh, very possibly. Uh, over time, we're going to minimize that as best we can. But when you're looking at these kinds of numbers, it's very difficult to do it without some reduction in force. As much as possible, we'll do that through retirements uh, and other things to uh, minimize the, the impact on our employees. But it's, uh, it's, it's something that um, is uh, going to be a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. As you look at, at this budget issue, are there any areas that are off limits that you know you don't want to be cutting or, or that you're telling people not to even look at? Well, very few. Um, police department is off limits. Uh, we have an outstanding police force at UMD, but it's a fairly modest size police force, and that's an area that we, we simply cannot take any uh, more cuts in. Uh, we're also going to preserve the library resources as much as, as much as we can. And there are a few others, but, but not many. I think mm -hmm. to, to do this kind of work well, you really need to force yourself to take a hard look at, at everything. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned revenue generation. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean tuition could be going up for students? Does it mean that to, uh, a broader recruitment effort? What do you like? It, it's at? more broader recruitment and, uh -huh. and increasing uh, the numbers of students coming. Uh, we are not looking at tuition increases, we hope. Those decisions are made by the Board of Regents. We don't, do not make them locally, but uh, at UMD, the administration is very committed to doing what we can to uh, keep tuition steady, and uh, we've been able to do that the last couple of years. Uh, we had a small increase this year, uh, but we're hoping that uh, there will be no increase next year, but we'll have to wait and see. But Chancellor, are, are fewer students going to four-year colleges now? Uh, overall, yes, nationally as well as in the state of Minnesota, in large part because there are fewer, there have been fewer numbers of high school students. Uh, because of demographic changes, um, there, there have been fewer students available. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but we're, we, we've done pretty well. We've, we've had some declines, but we've also had some important uh, increases. And right now we're tracking on about an 8% increase in new students for next year. Your chemistry course appears to be doing well. Extremely well and in very high demand. All, all of our sciences and engineering programs are, are at capacity uh, right now. You think you'll get some bond bonding monies uh, for the new chemistry lab? We certainly hope so. Uh, and things are looking very bright. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in St. Paul over the last several weeks. Uh, I really appreciate also the help we're getting from our faculty and staff in lobbying. Uh, our uh, Department of uh, Marketing at Public Relations is doing a fantastic job of, of lobbying our legislators. And uh, this week we had uh, Bulldog Day at the Capitol, <laughs> which was uh, an effort led by our students and also supported by staff and some faculty members. They, they were down in St. Paul this week talking about the great things. I, and I'm hearing very positive comments as I talk with legislators both in the House and Senate. Also, uh, officials with the governor's office, we're getting a lot of support there. So I think if there is a reasonably sized bonding bill this year, then we will be in very good shape. Uh, our building, Chemistry and Advanced Material Sciences, is the number one priority for the University of Minnesota in terms of their building priorities. Uh, the university always, the, the first thing they always ask for is funding for renovation costs in this category called HEPRA. Uh, which stands for Higher Education Asset Preservation and Replacement. Can the old building be used or do you have to tear it down? The old building, no, the old building is actually still in very good shape and it was constructed in uh, 1947. It was um, about the first building on the current campus uh, when the campus was primarily located uh, down on 5th Street at the Old Main. Uh, but the, bu the building itself is still in good shape, so it's just in terms of chemistry labs and facilities, sure. it, can't, uh, it, it can't do what we need to do now in terms of modern science, and it has a lot of uh, space limitations. But we fully intend to renovate it uh, after the new building is occupied. Uh, it'll still serve us for many, service well for many years to come. Mm -hmm. I think the last time that you were here, you talked about how UMD was really focusing on those STEM courses. Mm -hmm. um, is, is this part of... Uh, creating that vision going forward? Well, it's part of it, mm -hmm. but, but it's by no means the whole picture because we have outstanding programs in liberal arts and sciences, uh, liberal arts as well as the sciences. Uh, we have outstanding programs in the fine arts. Uh, our business school is outstanding. 
our education and human service profession uh, areas are, are doing extremely well. So we, we want to continue to feature our strengths in those, er those programs that are in high demand, but also continue to provide opportunities in other areas because we view ourselves as a more comprehensive institution. We're not a technical college or a university that focuses primarily on, on STEM areas uh, exclusively. Realistically, where do you think UMD will be 10 years from now? Uh, it'll be still right here in Duluth. It'll be <laughs> bigger than it is now by some measure. Not sure how much bigger. Uh, but our focus is really not so much on size, although I'd like to see us a bit larger than we are now. But our focus is really on quality, uh, continuing to uh, uh, build upon our land grant tradition and our sea grant tradition, uh, continuing to um, prepare our students to be uh, uh, successful, uh, continuing to have research that really makes a difference in this part of the country. I think uh, one of our hallmarks through our uh, Natural Resources Research Institute, our Large Lakes Observatory, uh, through incredible research that's happening around the world. We have uh, uh, geographical research that's being conducted in Antarctica, uh, as well as uh, uh, research in other places. So I think I think you will see us with a greater, even greater regional and natu uh, national stature academically, and we'll continue to be a good citizen for northeastern Minnesota because we, we're proud of the impacts we have, not only in the sciences, but also in the culture of this region, uh, the impacts that we have on social service agencies, the way we are involved in the, the primary uh, challenges that Duluth faces. Um, and so I, we'll, I think within 10 years you'll continue to see us grow and, and be a, a shining beacon up here on the hill. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about working with local business and industry to, to try to make sure that graduates have the right skills. Are, are, are your graduates getting jobs? Because that's been a complaint in higher education that people come out with all of this debt and then they aren't able to land jobs to, well, we to have, pay it back. We have much to brag about there in uh -huh. terms of UMD students. Uh, according to our latest survey conducted just last year, 97 percent of our of our graduates are employed within a year of graduation or they are pursuing medical school law school etc now in the sciences and engineering that's about a hundred percent in fact many of our engineers are getting job offers as seniors some as juniors mm -hmm. so we talk about the value of a umd education and part of that value is that our graduates throughout all of our majors are doing extremely well and uh, the job op opportunities are out there for good people uh, who have the skills. And, and we're keeping more of them in Duluth, uh, which we're proud of. That's as what well. we'd like to hear. That's, that's <laughs> always good news. It, it is for us as well. All Very right, good. Chancellor Black, thank you so much for coming in and visiting with us. And good luck as the school year ends. It's always great to be here. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Thanks. Bye. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Almost six years ago, the Corrections Department ordered St. Louis County to make their existing jail safer or move out. Six years later, in the midst of a prison population explosion, they have not only decided to move out, but to build new outside of downtown Duluth. Commissioners today voted to build at the Cook Home site. It's located several miles from the downtown area. It's near other county-related facilities, including a jail for juvenile delinquents. It would house 152 prisoners and cost around $12 million to build and nearly $6 million to operate. Having decided location, the greatest obstacles may yet lie ahead, getting a building permit. Some feel residents of the Duluth Heights will reject the idea of building in their backyard. In addition, there are thousands of unmarked graves here. Several new housing developments and a remodeled school are being planned for an area across the street from the jail site. Residents near the location have mixed feelings about the county's choice. Public hearings will be held on whether to grant a permit for the new jail. John Gagner, KDLH News.
Twin Port shipping season got off to a fast start this spring thanks to a relatively light covering of ice on Lake Superior. The port has already seen its first saltwater vessels of the season and coal and iron ore shipments are once again moving up and down the lakes. The local economy is buoyed by this free flow of commerce on the Great Lakes. So for an outlook on the 2016 shipping season, joining us is Vanta Cota II, the director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. Vanta, thank you very much for being here. What does the start of the season look like? Well, thanks for having me. Um, for us, it's, it's like opening day of baseball. I mean, to see the, uh, the ships start to come in and to see that sur first salty. Yeah. Uh, and today we had uh, our first uh, uh, unloading of a heavy lift vessel at, at uh, our dock, uh, the Clure Public Terminal. Um, from a 2016 perspective on the shipping season, um, I, I said it when, when I first came here, uh, we are a resource port. And so natural resources, commodities uh, are going through a challenging time, uh, especially through our region, but throughout the nation, mm -hmm. all, all commodities from, from oil to, to iron ore to grain. Um, and it's just one of those cycles that we're in right now. So mm -hmm. from a volume perspective, um, I believe this past year has been um, uh, the bottom on many of these commodities. And from here, we should see a solidification of that bottom and then begin to move up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how quickly does that turnaround happen after a year like last year? Wow. Uh, every every cycle is different, um, so uh, this this cycle seems to be firming up uh, uh, very nicely, uh, largely due to some some uh, benefit that our uh, congressional leaders had in in uh, uh, some trade discussions and action that was taken. So the steel market is again uh, firmed up a bit in pricing is firming up. So that's always a good sign. Our demand throughout the United States has remained uh, fairly uh, steady. Uh, so it's not been a demand issue. It's been an oversupply from, mm -hmm. from other uh, areas. Last year, did more grain move through here than ore? Yes. Uh, no, <laughs> not than ore, no. Okay. Uh, but we did have a, a, a greater percentage of grain I see. Uh, move last mm -hmm. year. We were up about 9%, which is a uh, 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 always a good sign. Now certainly other products have moved through here other than ore and grain. One of them, uh, wind turbines. What other, what kind of products move through here that maybe the public doesn't hear all that much about? Yeah, so um, down at the Clure Public Terminal, uh, which is our dock, the, the Port Authority's dock, what we mostly see are the big heavy lift uh, uh, operations. Um, that's what our, our dock and our crews are known for. Um, uh, we, we won awards for this and um, uh, uh, we've done everything from from pressure vessels going out to uh, manufacturing sites uh, as far away as Calgary uh, to the wind turbines. Um, uh, we've even had uh, uh, what would be considered a huge trash compactor for for a landfill, and it's just a a, a very large bulldozer with teeth on it. it um, so, as as a, a person who loves transportation and, and infrastructure. I'm like a big kid. I get to see all this stuff and drive around the, the docks and look at it. Uh -huh. And you just uh, signed a, a new agreement with your terminal operator, Lake Superior Warehousing. How important is, is that partnership and the success uh, of the port? And the yeah, port so Lake Superior Warehousing, um, they are our partner and have been for 25 years. Um, that relationship is uh, really gives us our world-class service uh, moniker. Uh, the individuals that work uh, on the dock uh, are, are very conscientious. Um, we get more compliments from ship captains about the efficiency and the work ethic of our crews uh, than I've been anywhere in, in my logistics career. So uh, it was very valuable for us to to make sure that that relationship mm -hmm. would continue. Uh, last summer, um, uh, that agreement was about to, to sunset in about a year and a half. And um, our problem was we had to have a conversation of five-year planning mm -hmm. in a one and a half year time frame. 
and we quickly realized that that wasn't going to work. So how does a port attract future growth? Is there a marketing campaign? Uh, yes, and so one of the things that our new agreement uh, led us to is that we need to be recognized uh, in a new brand, and the new brand that we came up with was Duluth Cargo Connect, and it's, it's uh, monikered as a working relationship uh, uh, between our two organizations. So now it allows people to understand that, that uh, this organization, LSW, and the Duluth Seaway Port Authority are one entity and that we're, when we show up to meetings, it's not so awkward as to, uh, well, I understand who you are and I understand who you are, but why are you here together? So now we have, ha have a common name and a common identity that we can, we can uh, literally give uh, individuals a business card and they will understand our relationship. You broke ground about a year ago on the Duluth Intermodal Project. How is that coming together and what are the opportunities there to maybe expand cargoes and, and so you're less vulnerable to all of those natural resource uh, cycles? Yeah, so uh, the, the construction, this uh, really mild winter has been uh, a blessing to us. Uh, our crews, uh, construction crew, uh, Lunda, they work throughout the winter. Um, I think they took three, three weeks off, uh, two for holidays and one for a safety uh, 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 event that they normally hold, which um, is amazing that we could continue to work through, through the winter. So we are right now on time uh, and within sight of, of the proper budget that we, we had. Um, and our greatest hope for that doc is that it is the next 50 years of commerce for uh, our organization. Uh, it, it doubles our uh, lay down capacity. We can handle heavy lift uh, twice as heavy that we uh, handled before. So it, it really gives us a, a lot of more muscle and, and flexibility. What would the port like to see at the old Georgia Pacific site? Uh, I would like to see it operating in industrial use. Uh, uh, Jeff Foster was a recent purchase. I, I wish them all the, the luck and we're rooting for all the industrial jobs that uh, ca can come to Rice's Point. Um, uh, those jobs are important to the community. They're, they sustain families and at the end of the day that just makes us a stronger community. Mm -hmm. We don't have much time but there was a, a report um, just a week or so ago about there being no new confirmed species of uh, aquatic invasives in, in the Great Lakes for the last 10 years. The ballast requirements working? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a, a task that you have to remain vigilant on. Uh, we, we've, we at the Port Authority have always been involved with uh, um, uh, monitoring that situation. Um, the Great Ships Initiative over in Superior um, uh, is, is a ballast testing facility that is very important to us. We, we were one of the original uh, members who promoted that. Uh, it's still uh, doing good work and, and our hope is that, that we get to a, uh, a system, mm -hmm. a filtering system that, that is uh, reasonably uh, 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 as far as cost wise and reasonably um, uh, takes out any potential. Mm -hmm. And on that, we'll have to end. Vontakota Port Authority Director, thank you so very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's time now for the week's business headlines from Business North. Minnesota Congressman Rick Nolan told a convention of mining engineers Tuesday that he supports both ferrous and non-ferrous mining on the Iron Range and near the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. He said Minnesotans have the knowledge, technology, and skill to mine iron ore and precious metals while still protecting lakes and forests. His first term in the House of Representatives was at the time the BWCA was designated as a protected wilderness. He said Congress agreed to use some 
some of the land for mixed use purposes, including mining, noting that a deal is a deal, and we've got to honor that deal. Ground was broken today for a new 26,000 square foot student housing project at Vermilion Community College in Ely. The $5.5 million investment by Minnesota State Colleges and Universities will fund construction of 12 units that all together will contain 120 beds. Construction of the three-story dormitory is expected to be complete by next spring. Krauss Anderson Construction Company is the general contractor. Iconics Corporation of Duluth has entered into a long-term supply agreement with California-based Encore Composite Structures. Encore is a major manufacturer of aircraft interiors. Iconics will provide materials that Encore will incorporate into composite structures used in commercial aircraft. The materials will be made at Iconics Advanced Materials Solutions Business Unit. That unit is located in a recently completed facility in Morgan Park, which has developed technology to create acoustic sound deadening and weight reduction for aerospace applications. The supply agreement runs through the year 2021. And for that and more on uh, these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Finally tonight, you may have heard about the One River Many Stories project going on throughout the month of April. It's a collaboration of storytellers in the region focused on the St. Louis River. Our colleagues from WDSE's The Playlist program recorded community stories about the river at an event at the Duluth Depot this past week. The result is a series of short stories you'll be seeing throughout the month on WDSE. Tonight we are sharing Mike's story. My name is Mike Casey Jr. I live in Smithville, which is right between Morgan Park and Riverside. My St. Louis River story is about the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad. I moved to Smithville in uh, 1995, so for 18 years I heard this whistle go by on Saturdays and Sundays. And when I was out paddling and boating, you'd see the train go by. It was an interesting little train. Uh, the switchyard engine I've come to know, and they had this other car in the back where passengers could hang out outside. So for 18 years, I've been hearing this whistle go by, and I, you know, I, I really got to volunteer with these guys. Lo and behold, within a year, I became a uh, fireman on, on the train. So I've become kind of active with the railroad now. So it's a beautiful little train that hardly anybody knows about in the area. Um, I've had a wonderful time working working there. A fun train to ride. Now, if you have a comment on this week's show, this is the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 and leave a message. Or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org and visit the WDSE website for the latest updates on your favorite programs, news about the station, and upcoming events. And Julie, I think just about everybody in the region has a story to share about the St. Louis River. Mine's fishing, like fishing the river. There's fishing, and I'm sure there will be lots more stories to come as that area is developed. I People think are you're really right. looking at it and appreciating it. That's for, for the sure. treasure that it is. For Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.